Uh, we just have one more a um, one more presentation for the day, and um, the presenter's name is Janet McGowan, who is now um, a director of operations at PTFS Europe. And um, Janet has worked with the company since 2011, and has a background as a systems librarian at a UK university library. Uh, she says she likes cats and books. Her favourite colour is green, and her favourite New Zealand sweet is the Perky Nana. So that's an unusual, unusual choice, but the Perky Nana lovers love the Perky Nana. So um, I'm going. I'm going to leave you with Janet shortly. Um, so last talk for the day. I'll pop back briefly for a roundup after this, and um, then that'll be us until tomorrow or tonight, depending where you are in the world. Cheers. Hello, greetings from the UK. I'm Janet McGowan. As you can see, I'm Director of Operations here at PTFS Europe. As part of my role at the company, I oversee project implementations and our support service. Being a relatively small company, there are 17 of us in all. I'm still very hands-on and always happy to be the project lead for new projects that come my way. I find running a COA rollout is a really satisfying part of my job. So in my session today, I'm going to be talking about some of the customization bits and pieces that we tend to do either as part of a project implementation or as ongoing support for our customers. I've been with um, the company since 2011 and have seen huge changes to Koha as it is matured over the years. As we know, Koha is in use in hundreds of libraries around the world. Um, but of course, libraries have their own workflows and ideas of what they want from a system. In calling this session, you say tomato, I say tomato, I hope to highlight some of the changes that we've habitually made for customers. Whatever our international or even sectoral differences, I'll showcase how Koha gives us the flexibility to manage different requirements. I'll be looking primarily at customizations that are possible from the staff user interface, not from the back end. In addition, I will look at some areas where changes to core code have meant that CSS or jQuery changes are no longer required. This is because increasingly more and more features become mainstream as system preferences, for example, which makes customization easier and changes simpler to sustain. So, first of all, um, a bit of background about our customer base. For all you support companies out there, I should imagine this sort of spread of sector isn't that unusual. We have customers ranging from public libraries to government organisations to academic sites, further and higher education. Uh, we have hospital libraries and consortia, law libraries and special libraries. So from that range, you can probably anticipate there is always going to be differences in requirements. Um, so from a project infrastructure point of view, we see differences between sectors, such as the need to set up self-issue SIP clients in academia versus the use of COA SCO self-issue in law and special libraries. Um, and then from the OPAC side of things, how do you promote your COA OPAC? Is it the front end for users? Do you want to integrate EDS into Koha using the EBSCO plugin? Or is the preference to have your own discovery layer such as Viewfind or Summon up front? So these are the sort of areas that get ironed out during project planning. Um, but what about other smaller types of change that make such a difference to libraries and to library users? So let's talk about language. As we're in the UK, one of the first things we tend to do prior to initial OPAC training session is to make sure that, at the very least, the first view of the catalogue keyword index is spelt our way. So catalogue to catalogue with a UE. 
So as a quick fix on the Kohar OPAC for our UK customers, we tend to always change catalog to catalog with a UE with a little bit of jQuery in OPAC user JS, which you can see there. So it's a small thing. Sometimes this is enough of a change to make. But of course, many of our special and law libraries have offices in many other countries. So having British English spelling isn't such a big issue. Then we have the good old cart, the simple cart. Oh, what controversy, you wouldn't believe. We all know what the cart is for. A session-based place to keep records temporarily um, in order to download records, save them in different formats, or reserve multiple books at a time. We're all familiar with that. But over the years, we've come across requests from for several different naming conventions for this oh-so-simple feature. <clears throat> so we've been asked to call it Trolley. We've been asked to call it My Items. We've been asked to call it several variations on folder, my folder with a space, the rather jaunty my folder without a space, um, or even session folder. We've been asked to call it basket, which of course adds a little confusion to the context of the acquisitions basket for ordering. <clears throat> and then of course users can switch off the basket entirely with the system preference OPAC book bag. I think often reasons given for renaming the cart is because for many libraries adding something to a cart gives the impression of purchase. In online shopping we add our purchases to a cart prior to the checkout. In these cases we steer away from terminology that indicates a monetary transaction. So changing the term cart to folder, for example, may have more of an academic feel and will sometimes even be asked to hide the little trolley icon itself, the shopping bar basket icon itself. So it's really great when we can manage a change using a simple system preference to disable a feature, such as in this instance with the OPAC book bag switch. However, changing the name of certain features can involve lots of jQuery. So an example of lots of jQuery. Take this snapshot of part of the OPAC user JS block, which shows just a sample of the code that is needed to rename all the bits of the cart to, from cart to, in this instance, my items or item list, combination of those terms. And of course, that's a really large overhead. And what about then if the core code um, in the next version of COA for the OPAC changes a little bit with the next release? So for a more sustainable approach, there is the ability to use a, trans a translation package. Of course, the most obvious reason for a translation is because we all speak different languages. We have sites with language packs installed for French, German, Hebrew, Russian, to name but a few. But in addition, there is the ENGB language pack, which allows for a consistent application of our British English spellings. Um, so there is the community um, wiki site. In recent years, the ENGB translation has actually been maintained on the Poodle system for the most part by my husband, John McGowan. We like to keep Koha in the family at our house. From the Koha community website, there is a link to the Poodle translation server, which lists all the language packs that can be installed on your Koha system. So that does need applying at the back end. But with new releases, John will spend several hours turning English into English. He'll be updating trans terminology such as catalog to catalog with that oh so famous UE on the end. Patrons become users, checkout becomes issue, check in becomes return, holds become reservations. And alongside the, this, the ENGB translation introduces the cart to folder switch.
So the translations are great. They ensure that there is consistent usage across both the OPAC and staff interface. So for spelling differences, terminology differences, the translations really help with this. But what about where there are requests for extra functionality? So for cases like this, I've called it shifting priorities, we can fall back again to making good use of jQuery. So where the OPAC is the landing point for the user experience, getting it right becomes very important. By default, the basic search in Koha gives a, a really good selection of indexes, title, ISBN, ISSN, uh, subject, and so on. But for us, it's not uncommon to be asked to move them around, particularly if people are migrating from a system where title search is has been the starting point we might be requested to move title search to the default as in this example that i've got on screen there um, so in this instance we're moving title search and we're inserting it at the top of the masthead search other Requ requests that have been made are to change title search to a title phrase search to get more of a exactness in in the in the search and we can see the um, results of that in the snapshot there but in addition uh, the this next is another example of a frequently asked question for us can we have a journal search on the basic search bar can we have an electronic material search on that basic search option set so for libraries i think that haven't introduced a discovery platform um, who are cataloging all of their electronic materials using koha uh, this can be a really key way for end users to find library electronic data of course a user, as we know, can go to advanced search and combine search terms with item types or locations or collection codes to get the same result. But as long as a material is identifiable as an item type, uh, with a bit of jQuery, uh, as described here on the screenshot on the left hand side, uh, you can add an electronic search or a journal search to the pull down list on the basic search. So we can see here electronic has been added to the list. So Really, the ability to add CSS to the OPAC or the staff interface with the right system preferences means we can hide or change the look of features. Yes, I'm afraid some people don't want to enable the mark view on their OPAC, um, but a little bit of um, code in OPAC user CSS dis hides that display of mark view using the display none there. Um, and I think what we're also asked, so I've been thinking so about features around the OPAC, but in addition, we've often asked about making changes to how the actual bibliographic records display in full and results view, not just the features surrounding them, such as the display of a mark view or the display of a cart. <clears throat> so underlying the displays for the bibliographic records in full and results in full view and results view are the XSLT style sheets. The style sheets such as in the OPAC mark 21 slim to OPAC detail dot XSL mark 21 slim to OPAC results dot XSL. They really trip off the tongue. Um, I've certainly dipped into these files on the server to make changes to them. I've added tags that relate to instrumentation for some of our music libraries because those types of mark tag aren't present by default in the XSLT and for the majority of libraries they wouldn't need to be but for some sectors they are. However, now increasingly I'm finding that the way that these style sheets are put together, it uses classes and IDs throughout. And because of that, we can use those identifiers to make changes to the display. 
So here on the left, we can see how um, we've been able to pull out the class online resources, online underscore resources, um, and that allows us to apply some styling to an element of the record. And in this instance, the part of the record that is marked up with the class online resources, correspondingly, it's the 856 tag that we're enabling, we have the ability to change. So on the right hand side, we can see two alternatives for two different customers, how they've chosen to display, how they've chosen to represent the 856 tag in the results view. Um, so we can see here this online access for JISC News, sort of highlighted, a bold, bit bolder, um, a, a sort of brighter colour. And then in the example below, we've got online access for Springer, and it's set in a in a, in a square box there. So it just brings it more prominently to screen. So essentially in each instance, the customer wanted a clearer view of those 856 links. And by hooking onto the classes as described in the XSLT style sheets, we can enhance the display. So we're still using CSS. We still have to add our CSS elements into OPAC user CSS, but we can easily promote fields by doing that as long as we can identify them. So I've just put up a few examples of where we've used some CSS and jQuery to do things. As I'm sure you all know, there are great resources on the community pages for jQuery and CSS snippets, and I've put them up here as links. Coera lets us make all these changes with CSS and jQuery, but there is always an associated caveat with this because with new Coa versions, the hooks that we use to select elements in a jQuery statement or, or even with a bit of CSS may change. And as a result, they may stop working or may not work as we expected. Also for CSS on the OPAC, we sometimes need to revisit um, styling that has been applied previously in a, on an OPAC page. If the page layout has changed fractionally, we may need to reapply margins or colors or um, background layout and so on. So with this in mind, ultimately, it is great whenever we're able to manage different custom requirements as much as possible through the options available in the admin interface. So COA enhancements make things easier. Um, COA enhancements always think, seem to be coming in that fill gaps where previously we might have had to resort to using and adding extras with relying heavily on jQuery. Several versions ago, I was asked, I was adding jQuery to intranet user JS, so the staff side JavaScript area, um, in order to group reports for a customer on the circulation homepage. So I've added the snippet of jQuery that I added. It uses the jQuery syntax, and it's adding a, 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 some HTML after uh, a particular element on the circulation page. But of course, you do need to know that jQuery syntax. You need to know how to use it. And that can really act as a barrier for library systems admins. So this is the after. Now we have the system preference intranet circulation home HTML. With this in place, with this system preference in place, it is possible to add a button for a report with a bit of HTML markup directly to the circulation homepage without any jQuery at all. And this makes customization of this sort much more accessible to more and more COA systems admin staff. So here we can see just adding in the HTML into intranet circulation home HTML gives me my new custom holds to pull report um, at the bottom of the circulation block on the circulation page. It's also worth pointing out that there's uh, the intranet reports home HTML, which acts as the same, allows the same sort of customization with HTML, but on the reports homepage. 
so another um, instance of where changes have come in to make all our lives easier um, is in the staff interface again. But in the past, customers have preferred where customers have preferred a much shorter patron modification page with fewer details, hiding things like um, perhaps date of birth or multiple contact detail blocks. Previously, we've had to do that using jQuery. Um, and in this instance here, we can see I've hidden the date of birth field, I've hidden um, the label for the date of birth field and so on, and renaming a contact field in this instance with the .html action. But the introduction of the system preference borrower unwanted field accommodates hiding fields like that. Um, it gives us an easy way to suppress fields. All we need to do is add in the right database columns into the block in order to suppress the fields that we don't wish to see on that patron modification page. If we want to, we can still relabel fields, um, such as in this instance, relabeling alternate contact information as staff contact. We can still relabel fields with jQuery, but hiding patron fields now is much easier to manage and is part of basic systems admin rather than a specialized customization. And that has to be a good thing. So going back to the OPAC, um, on the OPAC academic libraries I've worked with have often wanted to trim down the number of um, export options. There's a, a great deal available in the OPAC by default. For academics, that might be to highlight RIS, the RAS format, um, for their bibliographic software integrations, or hide mark export op options, for example, to avoid confusion. And we used to handle this uh, with jQuery in OPAC user JS, and you can see the examples there, hiding the RIS value, hiding the bib text value, um, so that they would not display as um, exportable options. But now on the right hand side, we can see the system preference OPAC export options. It's a case of setting tick boxes when we want to hide or otherwise different um, export options. It's perfect. And I think one of my favorite additions in recently has been to do with facets. So the range of facets and the order that they show on the OPAC is something that frequently arises. Certain facets are not required for some sectors, like places in the example here. Um, in, in this instance, previously, we've had to use jQuery, jQuery to remove the facet, or you could also do that with CSS if you wanted to, but it, um, it picks out the ID and it hides it. Alternatively, some facets for some customers may take a higher priority as they might want subjects to come above item types uh, when they're viewing their facet options on the OPAC. But with Elasticsearch, you can control which facets you want to display and in which order they are. It becomes a simple an admin task. So in the Elasticsearch administration area, we have our facets. We can tick which ones we want to show on the OPAC. And it, this works as a drag and drop uh, functionality. So I can click and drag my facets into different orders depending on how I want to display them, which facets are more important to me. So I think essentially in this se session, I wanted to showcase really Koha's flexibility. When you think of the numbers and types of COA implementations around the world, there are bound to be differences in usage and requirement. And I've barely, I've only picked out a few here today. But COA does give us the flexibility to make changes, but also, uh, and that's particularly with allowing us to get at jQuery with OPAC user JS, we can get at CSS with OPAC user CSS. But as versions go by, it becomes increasingly possible to use new features that are brought into the core code 
And that minimizes customization work um, and gives library sysadmins more and more tools to tailor their COA systems without a large support overhead. So from my point of view in projects and implementations, that's also a, a great thing. Which brings me towards the end of my session. Um, so finally, really, when I thought about this session back in January, I thought I'd be traveling to the lovely New Zealand in person. Um, and for me, um, it had an added, added, added joy because it would have meant I could have visited my brother. And he lives near Temata Peak. Um, and I'm afraid this wasn't out of my mind when I picked, I must admit, the somewhat cheesy title of my session, You Say Tomato, I Say Tomato. Uh, so I wish I was at Temata. Um, alas, I won't be visiting any time soon. But thanks for letting me have a slot at COACON. Um, we're thinking of you all during the, um, the COACON. I know this is pre-recorded, but thinking of you all will be tuning in in the wee hours um, and, and uh, watching all of these sessions. Um, thinking of you all, have a great conference. Thanks for listening. <laughs>